faces for sure. <laughs> um, welcome to the AOR 4.1 uh, webinar for grades five through nine. We are going to focus primarily on um, those grades today. And this is just part one. So a little bit of housekeeping before we get started are our introductions. So my name is Mandy Hawker. I'm the elementary education associate for ELA. Um, and I have with me two of my colleagues today. I have Brenda McCormick, who is our secondary ELA ed associate. And then I have Casey Prince Harvey, who is our humanities education associate, and she supports ELA as well. Um, you'll notice that none of us are specifically middle level. Um, that's because our middle level ed associate has moved on to her next phase in life. Um, so Tabitha has moved on to uh, her next steps and we're all um, managing that gap in her absence. Um, I'm filling in this week for um, AOR 4.1 and I'll be doing part one and part two. Brenna, um, supported us with part uh, one and two of AOR 3.1. And then in a few weeks, Casey Prince Harvey is going to be supporting us with AOR 5.3. So just wanted to introduce us. If you will introduce yourselves in the chat, um, let us know who you are, where you serve, and um, let us know what you've been doing this week. Anything fun, any summer activities, what have you been up to? Hopefully, y'all been doing some fun stuff. I see some familiar names that we've seen several times this summer, so that's good. Angie, I led a webinar this morning for some uh, Cherokee County and had some Cherokee County participants, so it's good to see you. Oh, friends visiting from out of state. Oh, getting ready for your family to visit. So does that mean you're cleaning your house? Because that's always my cue to go get busy. <laughs> oh, you're 29. Oh, my gosh. That's incredible. Wow. Oh, my gosh. 16 chickens. That's that. Mm, that sounds like a summer adventure. <laughs> awesome. Lots of travel. I love that. Um, Thornwell Charter School, Amber Pennington. It is so great to see you. I will be seeing you on a regular basis coming up because my little boy is starting kindergarten at Thornwell. So I'm I'm ooh, I'm excited, but I'm terrified. Um, so anyway, great to see y'all. I'm so thankful to have y'all here with us. Um, playing with your grandkids. That's the best investment of time right there. I love it. And then Miss Huff, it's good to see you. Miss Huff was actually my teacher when I was in middle school. So Feels, it feels so like daunting to present uh, to you today, um, but I'm excited. All right. Well, um, now that we've made a few introductions and made some connections with each other, I also want you to access the landing page and the attendance form in the chat. So um, Brenna's going to drop those links in. The landing page is just the place where all of our resources are linked today. Um, we pretty consistently with our webinars use a landing page to house all of the resources that we share just because it's one easy place to find everything you'll need um, throughout our session today. Additionally, you'll see the link to the attendance here and on the landing page. The attendance helps us with our federal requirements of who we are supporting across the state. Um, just knowing who's represented in the audiences and then um, how we are doing with making sure we are supporting all across South Carolina. So if you will complete both of those, I would appreciate it. Again, the link is in the chat. I think the landing page link was also sent um, by email this morning. All right, and we'll go ahead and move on. All right, so we have a recertification credit offering for the summer webinars. We're so excited about this. We hope that you've enjoyed this opportunity um, to seek recertification credit in some of these um, virtual webinars this summer. We do have three requirements for those recertification credits. The first is live attendance and participation in our session today. The second is to remain in attendance for the duration of our time together. And then finally, completing that attendance form that was just dropped in the chat, as well as the feedback form at the end of our session together today. Completing all three of those requirements will allow you to receive one hour of recertification credit for every in-person hour we are here together today. Now, 
This webinar is set up as part one of a two-part series. Part one today will focus just on the information around AOR 4.1 for grades five through nine. We'll focus on the vertical articulation of that standard. So what does it look like from fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and ninth grade? We'll look at shifts in the content expectations as well as the complexity expectations. And then finally, we'll look at the indicator intent by taking a closer look at those um, indicator insights that are provided for AOR 4.1. Part two in, uh, on July 5th is going to focus on the instructional applications. So what does this look like when I'm teaching this in my classroom? Um, just want to make you aware of the expectations for today. Again, today will be a lot of information, uh, but then July 5th, right after the 4th of July, is going to be that application piece. Um, so with that being said, let's dig into our purpose. Today's purpose is to explore AOR 4.1 for grades 5 through 9. And a big focus of today is going to be to differentiate between purpose and perspective. Those were not defined and articulated clearly in a previous iteration of our standards, but have been corrected in the new iteration of our standards. And we're doing that so that we can enhance our instructional strategies and improve student outcomes in regard to author's purpose and perspective. So with that being our purpose, let's take a look at this quote. If teachers interpret standards differently and emphasize different aspects of the standards during instruction, it's virtually impossible to guarantee all students will have access to the same rigorous curriculum. Think about that for just a second. What does that mean in light of our purpose? How might this quote affect, uh, apply to our work today? Go ahead and drop that in the chat for us. Kate, I love that you said guarantee a consistency. Yeah, we, we have a, a term we've coined here at the agency that says instructional efficacy, right? So the same thing that students are taught in my district are taught in your district. And it's taught the same way. We all have this, get on the same page. We have to comprehend the standards in the same way, right? We can't interpret them differently. If we do, what does that lead to? Inconsistency. Awesome, yes. We'll have consistent outcomes. Very good, yes. Um, oftentimes, we will refer to this quote in our trainings because we want to refocus our attention on the interpretation of our standards and emphasizing that we have to interpret them similarly so that instruction looks similar in every classroom across our state. There's not inconsistency. All right, very good, very good. All right, well, that being said, this is just part one where we are going to dig deep into the content understanding of the standards. And next time we'll get into that planning and instruction of assessments. But let's all begin our study of getting that same background knowledge around AOR 4.1. Our agenda today consists of three sections. The first section is where we're just going to look through some of the key terms associated with AOR 4.1. Then we're going to take a look at the vertical articulation and instructional shifts for AOR 4.1. We'll look, look at the crosswalk of how things have changed from our 2015 standards to our new standards. And then finally, we'll take a look at some clarity and closure. All right, our first activity today is going to be to take a look at the vertical articulation of AOR 4.1. Now, if you've been with us before and we've talked about the vertical articulation, I want you to remember that the vertical articulation is a table 
that shows us this standard and indicators articulated from kindergarten at the bottom all the way up to English 4 at the top. So it's kind of a, a vertical articulation, a vertical progression of that standard. As you're looking at this document, I want you to notice what key terms draw your attention. What terms do teachers and students need to know in order to demonstrate proficiency on these indicators? I'm going to give you three minutes to take a look at that. It's linked in the chat. I love it, Beth. Yes, you noticed. <laughs> the words are in bold. As you're reading through these, I do want you to pay attention to the bold words, but what other terms or words in these indicators do you think might be important? All right, so let's have a little discussion about some things that we're seeing in the chat. Initially, a lot of the terms that you brought forward were content terms, dealing with rhetoric, primary so account, secondary account, author's perspective, author's purpose. Those are definitely things that we need to clarify and confirm our definitions on before we move into um, digging into the standards very deeply. But then I saw you start to drop in some of the verbs or some of the um, rigor terms that are mentioned within those indicators. I really appreciate seeing uh, one person's comment talking about there's a vertical progression of the rigor. We begin in kindergarten with that identifying, first grade, distinguishing, identifying. However, if we look just at the verbs in those indicators, what do we notice? It's not a linear, it's not a linear progression, right? In some places, we go from determine, compare, analyze, back to determine. We're going to talk through some of that today. Why do we see such a shift in rigor? They build up in critical thinking, but we can't just depend on those verbs, Mariana, right? Very good. And I love this explanation. This is a very thorough um, Jessica <laughs> analysis. Um, I'm telling you, we're going to hire you to be um, our assistant, uh, Jessica. We're seeing some, some very insightful pieces from you. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on to looking at the key terms our students already know when they come to us in fifth grade. So in kindergarten, students are exposed to the term author and illustrator. In first grade, they begin to look at information from pictures and illustrations. How does that progress then in second grade? Then we see the introduction of the term author's purpose. In third grade, we see the introduction of the term author's perspective. 
And then in fourth grade, we see author's purpose conveyed through the author's perspective. Now, something important to point out here, look at second and third grade. Author's purpose is identified in second grade. Author's perspective is um, identified in third grade. That means that our fifth grade students and beyond should not be just identifying, describing, determining author's purpose and perspective when they get to fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. I think that's an important thing to acknowledge, especially um, with our teachers, is that students who come to us in fifth grade already have that base knowledge or should already have that base knowledge. So then we are tasked with um, a different cognitive expectation around those terms. Why do you think it's important to know what students have already been taught? Think about that for a second and then drop that in the chat for me. Amy, your message hits my heart. Don't waste too much time reteaching what they know. Hold them accountable to the grade level expectation for your grade level indicator. Yes, it gives us information of what they already know, and then we can scaffold our lessons. We don't make assumptions. Very good. Encourage deeper level of learning, especially for our middle level students. All right. Now, let's move on to our next slide. And we're going to talk about how author's purpose and author's perspective are defined differently from our 2015 standards. So these are two terms that are important from our grades K through four. Um, I want you to look at these two definitions. Take a moment and read them to yourself. Note in your mind how this aligns to how you've instructed author's purpose and perspective in the past. And then I want you to take a minute to respond in the chat to this question. How do these definitions clarify any misconceptions that you've heard about these terms? Alice, I love your comment about author's purpose. When our standards writers were developing our standards, one issue that they wanted to kind of correct from our 2015 standards was that author's purpose is more than persuade, inform, entertain. There are a variety of purposes for why an author writes something. We need to address those. And Emily, yes, there's a difference in the intention towards the audience. Author's perspective definitely um, helps, uh, wants us to ev evaluate that or, or um, engage in why an author has that perspective and what are they doing with that perspective. Purpose is the why. Very good. OK, we'll also notice that for the author's perspective definition, we have highlighted just the portion of uh, the definition for perspective that deals with informational text um, because 
AOR 4.1 is an informational text indicator and standard. Um, it deals only with informational text. So just keep that in mind as well. All right, now let's take a look at the key terms that are introduced in middle school. Think back to that vertical articulation um, shared a couple of slides back, and I want you to think about what terms were, start, were um, introduced in fifth grade. Anybody drop in the chat what term was introduced in fifth grade? Very good, yes. <laughs> Primary and secondary sources. Very good, yes. Then when we look at sixth grade, there is no new vocabulary introduced. So nothing new that we need to study. Um, the rigor changes, but not the content. When we look at seventh grade, what is new in seventh grade? Yes, rhetoric. <laughs> now, this is not the first time that rhetoric is introduced in our um, AOR strand. Um, it actually is introduced in sixth grade um, in a different indicator that Casey Prince Harvey will be teaching you about in just a couple of weeks. Um, when we look at eighth grade and an English one, there is not new vocabulary introduced there as we either. So we'll talk about the skills progression in the next section, but this just focuses us on our vocabulary. So let's take a look at the next slide where we have provided you the glossary definitions of those three terms, primary account, secondary account, and rhetoric. These three newly introduced terms in grades five through nine um, give us um, new content that we need to make sure we understand the definitions of and then share that understanding with our students. So let's take a minute just to look at the definitions. And then in the chat, I'd love for you to respond to the prompt um, at the bottom of your screen. How does primary account or secondary account or rhetoric relate to perspective in informational text? Very good, Alice. Yes, that's coming in our next slides. Okay. Oh, Amber, I love that. It, rhetoric relates to perspective because it is based on perception. Very good. It involves the author's purpose and their perspective based on their word choices. Oh, the author's intent and credibility. We're going to get to that. That's in one of our indicator insights coming up. You have to determine their validity and their credibility. Uh, it definitely, we're going to see that um, D night. We will see how an author's uh, perspective can be highly opinionated when we uh, look at a comparison of some text complexity in just a few slides. All right, very good. Well, now I want us to do a little read, respond, and reply. What we're going to do is I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. I want you to take at least one minute and respond um, in a complete thought to these questions. Then um, I'm going to have you read the responses that come through the chat, and then we're going to take a minute to reply to those. So it's kind of like a virtual turn and talk, so to speak. So all I want you to do is let's look at these two questions. Let's form a response and drop it in the chat. Why is it important to fully and clearly understand the key terms that we just read through the definitions of? And then how might knowing those key terms and definitions impact our planning, our instruction, and our classroom assessment? Go ahead and develop your answers for those questions and drop that in the chat.
I'm beginning to see answers populate in my chat. So as you see that, as you see those dropped in and you've entered yours into the discussion, I want you to read through some of the responses that are coming through. As you read through, choose one comment in the chat to reply to. You can reply with um, a reaction to give them a thumbs up or a heart or a laugh at their comment. <laughs> uh, or you can actually do the reply. Um, it's the little arrow symbol when you hover over a comment and reply and, and give your feedback or your insight. Things you may agree with or things that their comment left you thinking about. As you're working through your read and reply, I'll say two things. One, um, it is my biggest area of growth to um, use wait time in these situations. So I'm trying my best <laughs> not to comment on every comment I see. Um, and then secondly, um, I'm also trying my hardest not to use my mouse and like every comment I see because you all have such incredible insights. Thank you for engaging in the chat. It's so, so meaningful to me. A few things that I've seen, though, that um, are causing me uh, just to pause and really um, think about the instruction that I have um, around AOR 4.1 is one person said introducing and revisiting these terms throughout the school year is essential. I agree with that. I think that that's something that we need to share with our students. We need to share in our PLCs when we collaborate with other teachers, when we have vertical conversations. Um, these terms are defined in our ELA standards glossary that are specific to our ELA standards. So um, really engaging with those definitions is essential. Another comment I see is that maintaining consistency for students to be able to assess and apply their knowledge appropriately. That only levels the playing field and makes education um, accessible uh, for all students. So I, th I think that's another great insight. All right, that brings us to the end of section one. We've talked about those key terms related to AOR 4.1. Now let's dig into some meat and take a look specifically at the vertical articulation of um, AOR 4.1 for grades five through nine. Now, some of you may be middle school specific teachers and you may be thinking, well, why are we talking about grades five and English one in a middle school webinar? Well, it's important for us because how many of us as middle school teachers have students come to us not performing on grade level? Everyone. <laughs> um, I, I, I would venture to guess that everyone has students coming to us uh, reading or comprehending below grade level. So knowing their entry point from that fifth grade indicator is essential. But then also, how many of us have students who are um, taking English one in eighth grade? Yeah, it's important for us to have that information, but also for those students who are performing above grade level to extend our teaching into that. So um, it helps us to understand those gaps and meet the needs of all students. Now, on this slide, I want us to look closely at just that vertical articulation of ELA um, AOR 4.1 for grades five through English one. In the chat, Brenna has dropped in Appendix B. That's our vertical articulation document um, that's attached to our standards. Uh, I also have a screenshot of it right here for you on the screen. Remember that it goes fifth grade at the bottom, sixth, seventh, eighth, and English one. 
looking at that, I have two questions for you. The first question, what do you notice about the grade level that you primarily serve? Question two, why is it important to know the expectations of the grade level before and after yours? I'm going to give you three minutes just to look at that. As I see your answers pouring in, um, so much of the language you are bringing out and noticing in this vertical articulation are the things we're going to discuss over the next few slides. So it makes me think we are all here on a summer Tuesday afternoon um, learning about our new ELA standards, particularly AOR 4.1, and we are all easily and readily noticing these things. Think about your lens as as of having like you have that expertise you're noticing those things you see the content shifts you see the rigor shifts but let's also think about that first year teacher who's in your building are they able to identify the expectations for their grade level are they considering what students have been previously exposed to and then what the goal is for the next grade level so while some of this may feel laborious. It may feel um, slow paced. It may be something that you're like, I, yeah, I see that says compare and contrast. And I see sixth grade says analyze. Those things might jump out to you easily as an expert in your field. Um, but is any of this information something that you can take and share with the other teachers that you support in your schools or your buildings? Um, so I appreciate that so much. I love um your insights. I swear y'all could be teaching this um, <laughs> instead of me. So I'm excited to see your feedback. Um, it frees up the time to fine tune your skills instead of wasting time reteaching material. Oh my goodness. Hallelujah for that, right? We don't want to walk in any sixth grade classroom and see them identifying the author's purpose, <laughs> right? But you know what? We do see that. We do see that when we go into classrooms and, you know, it, it causes heart palpitations because you think the expectation in sixth grade is that you're analyzing. And here we are still identifying. So provides that roadmap. I love that, Latrice. All right. That moves us to our first deconstruction of the fifth grade indicator for AOR 4.1. In the first column, we see the code for that in the second column, that's the actual indicator language. And then in the third column, that is the indicator insight associated with um, fifth grade AOR 4.1. As we take a look at that, what is our rigor? 
A rigor is compare and contrast. Yes, easy to see. Now, I've included the definition of compare and contrast um, here on the screen for you. And um, the definition of compare and contrast also includes these little um, two second supporting sentences that describe what compare and contrast looks like for third through fifth grade and how that's different for sixth through eighth grade. Um, I only included the part about third through fifth grade because this is a fifth grade indicator. Um, but what do you notice about comparison and um, contrast in third through fifth grade? That it deals with what? Two or more concepts, very good. But it's explicit. Yes, Jessica. Yes, these, this is explicit um, compared and contrast the similarities and differences. When we go into sixth grade, that's where we get to that, those implied similarities and differences. Very good. Now, let's take a look at the content. What is new content for fifth grade? Primary account, secondary account, and perspectives. Now, the indicator insight here um, is a little confusing. Why does the indicator insight for Error 4.1 in fifth grade mentioned the terms bias, reliability, credibility. Hmm. That's right. It's about that subsequent grades um, leading into. So we know that indicator insights are, are for three reasons. First is to provide insight for that particular grade level. The other is for what's to come. It's preparing you for what's happening in subsequent grades. Or an indicator insight gives you insight of something that happened before um, that you need to know for your grade level. So in this case, we are being asked to consider these terms, bias, reliability, and credibility, because those will come into play in later grades. For more information or more support in um, making sure that your instruction meets the expectations on those terms, we do um, give you the suggestion of referring to the research support document. So that's available to you um, and has more information on bias, reliability, and credibility. All right, now let's take a look at comparing this new indicator in our new standards to the 2015 standard from the crosswalk. Well, um, AOR 4.1 for fifth grade connects to two indicators in 2015. The first of which is RI 5.1. And how often would we teach at RI 5.1? Every day, right? That's the one that stayed on your board all year long. You're using that text evidence. <laughs> you're making inferences. Uh, you're drawing conclusions. But additionally, the other indicator that's connected to AOR 4.1 is RI 10.1. Now let's take a look at how those are similar. Okay, so yes, the language is actually exactly the same. Compare and contrast a primary account and secondary account on the same topic or event. So you're already doing these things from our 2015 standards. It's exactly the same in our new standards. However, look right below that green box on the new side. We see an additional expectation of the indicator identifying how the different perspectives impact the content of the text. Noticing those differences, where will your planning instruction and your classroom assessment need to be adjusted to meet the new intent of the new indicator? What instructional shifts will you need to make to ensure you meet the expectation of that part of the indicator? Very good. It's all about the impact on the content. Very good. Ooh, Jen Hamilton. Hallelujah. Hands up. I agree with that. Your assessments will need to be adjusted. 
your questioning has to change. So there's an additional expectation to that indicator that we don't currently meet using the 2015 standards. So that's something that we need to um, adjust in our instruction. Now, looking at the 2015 side, um, here I see RI 5.1. Now, when we look at that indicator throughout our crosswalk document, we can kind of um, say to ourselves, oh, I know something special about RI and RL 5.1. And what do we know about that? It's that RL and RI 5.1 are now overarching expectation three and overarching expectation five. Well, what are overarching expectation three and five? On the next slide, let's take a look at that. They are make inferences to support comprehension and cite evidence to explain and justify reasoning. We know that the overarching expectations are the business of how we do ELA, right? This is what good ELA instruction looks like. Knowing that those are overarching expectations, these are done recursively and constantly in our ELA classrooms. So anytime you're in that crosswalk and you see that RLRI 5.1, you can say to yourself, oh, 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 what is this? Overarching expectation three and five. <laughs> Very good. All right. And good questioning has to be planned. You are exactly right. They don't just come out of your mind, do they? <laughs> okay, now let's take a look at our next slide. Here we're going to look at the sixth grade indicator. Now, for our rigor, what do we notice? We moved to analyze. Now, the definition for analyze is gigantic. Um, our next click-in will provide that definition to you. I did remove a, a, a little bit of the language just um, to focus on perspective, um, but this is the definition from our glossary. I'll let you read that for just a second. Okay, if our fifth grade rigor was about comparing and contrasting explicit similarities and differences, how is our sixth grade rigor different? Drop that in the chat for me. Or you can unmute if anybody else wants to talk. Now that Jessica, yep, yeah, we're making some inferences, we're drawing conclusions, yeah. we're inferring. That rigor is totally bumped up, right? Jessica, were you going to talk? Girl, I will I will be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was just saying what I already said in the chat. <laughs> that now instead of looking for what is already stated in the text, they have to be able to figure out what was not explicitly stated. I can't stated hear you, or I can't. I can hear her. Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, OK. Yep. Was... <laughs> yep. Cody, no. I love it. Yes, what is stated between the lines? So when we're analyzing, we're looking between the lines and we're thinking critically. Um, we're looking at the inferences and drawing conclusions from those. Awesome. Great job, y'all. So the rigor increased from compare and contrast to analyze because that's the next step in the progression, right? We're going from that explicit to a more implicit um, uh, understanding of primary and secondary accounts. We're still dealing with those, but we're adding in a few other pieces of content, talking about content and style. Now, this is a, a big point of question for me. I'll be honest with you all. I had to consult with my uh, colleagues, I had to ask Brenna and Casey for help on this because I'm looking at the sixth grade indicator. Okay. I know what it says. I've read it 10 times now, but then the indicator insight says refer to the rhetoric support document for rhetoric support. Y'all, I was, my mind was blown. Rhetoric's not mentioned in the indicator. Why does the indicator insight refer to the rhetoric support document?
Ooh, I love it. Very good, Amber. I like your answer. Style, content and style. Yes, style absolutely correlates to, um, to rhetoric. Very good. Yes, rhetoric impacts content and style. We see that very clearly in sixth grade AOR 5.3. Um, we all had a discussion just a couple uh, hours ago how we wish that the 5.3 webinar would have come before this one because so much of what's discussed there ties into the AOR 4.1 uh, webinar. So, um, but thinking about that, thinking about that rhetoric is first brought into instruction in sixth grade AOR 5.3. How could that instruction tie together or work together with AOR 4.1? Because perspective and rhetoric go hand in hand. The perspective impacts the rhetoric. Very good. And oh, Angie Blanton, I love that you said that. Yes, rhetoric is explicitly stated in the seventh grade indicator. Um, but it wasn't here. And I was so confused. I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. But when we think about it, um, how it, how your perspective impacts your content and style, well, that, those are your rhetorical choices um, that you're making. So mm, what a very insightful thing to look at in that indicator insight. All right. Now let's look at the crosswalk for sixth grade. Here we have our new indicator on the left and on the right, we have our 2015 indicator. What are our similarities? Let's click in my green boxes. Well, a lot of similar language, right? Analyze the primary and secondary account on the same topic. Okay, but what's different? Look at that um, left side with the new indicator. What comes after the green box? Very good. Very good, yeah, how the different perspectives impact the content and style of a text. Impact, I know, that's a heavy word, Eleanor. <laughs> All right, now let's also pop in our yellow box. What do we see over there on the 2015 side? Oh, what does that make us say? RI 5.1 is a <laughs> overarching expectation. Very good. Awesome. Yes, I'm so glad y'all are seeing that. That's OE3 and OE5. All right, Beth, I love your comment that our new indicator for sixth grade here is focusing more on that critical thinking. Yes, we're getting to that um, deeper uh, level of thinking about how the different perspectives impact the content and style of a text. Very good. So how will our planning instruction and classroom assessment change? Oh, the use of more authentic text. Yes. I was just reading an article this morning about um, the necessity of especially um, sixth grade and down. We are are we could do a better job of building content knowledge through text and how easy to do that with authentic text. Um, so that's been a, a commission of mine uh, thinking about PD for the fall of how can I use authentic text or use content rich text um, to support instruction. Rigorous text. Yes. Yes. That's a big one. We're going to talk about um, text complexity in just a minute. Cross-curricular planning. Oh, I love that idea too. <laughs> All right, let's move on and let's take a look at our seventh grade indicator. So here, the rigor um, for seventh grade goes to determine. The definition of determine in our glossary is to use information from a text to make an inference. But hold up a second. I noticed something about the change in those uh, verbs. Hmm. Determine to analyze. 
All right, we're gonna we're gonna think about that for just a second. Hold on to that in your brain, um, and we're gonna look at it more closely. Let's take a look at the content though. What shifts in the content? We're still talking about perspective. We're talking about purpose, but what's new here? Rhetoric. Yes, and our indicator insight there tells us to refer to the rhetoric support document. Well, there are um, there is a rhetoric support document on our ELA instructional resources page, but then there are also four additional rhetoric supplement documents. Um, I've given you a little screenshot here of what those look like, but we're going to drop into the chat um, the links for these support document and support document supplements. Um, and I want you to think about what content should you be referring to in this rhetoric support document or the supplements that would support your understanding of AOR 4.1? On the next slide, um, in the chat, I mean, in the speaker notes, Brennan, if you'll grab those links and drop them in the chat. Awesome. You're, you're ahead of me. Um, we want you to do an activity called read, note, and plan. What I'd like for you to do is read one of the rhetoric documents. You can read the rhetoric support document or any of the supplements. Brennan's dropping those in the chat now. And I want you to note how any of those documents might support your instruction of AOR 4.1. And then I want you to plan how to use this document for your next steps. Okay, I'm going to give you um, around five minutes to do this activity. Again, you're going to choose one of the documents in the chat. So the rhetoric support document or one of the four supplements. Read that document in its entirety. Note how that document might support the instruction of AOR 4.1. And then plan one way that you could use this document for a next step. All right, I'm going to be quiet for the next five minutes and let you work.
I love reading through your answers in the chat. Thank you for dropping those in. Um, before we get started talking about those responses in the chat, though, I do want to um, tell tell you I figured out why I couldn't hear Jessica a second ago. Um, my computer was on mute. So that'll do it, won't it? <laughs> Just a moment of transparency. Um, but anyway, I appreciate uh, your responses in the chat. I love seeing so many of you are mentioning ethos, pathos, and locos. Very good. Okay. Awesome. Does anybody want to unmute and talk to us about um, how they see these rhetoric support documents and supplements impacting their instruction? I can try again. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the one that I would say probably stood out to me the most was the rhetorical appeals ethos pathos and logos document uh, because it it leans so heavily on all of the other documents and because as you went down and looked at ethos examples it showed you know in this space or in that space or in this space uh, in you know, in politics, in ads, in literature, in, and it gave all of these opportunities. And I would definitely work with my grade level team to springboard that into opportunities for analysis, just for practice, and, you know, even as like a stations activity. Okay, try it here. What's the purpose here based on these little things that you can see? And give them kind of the rhetorical triangle with those explanations as a guide, you know, like as a resource document to help them determine purpose and then like uh, be able to also assess them in that way. So not only give them the opportunity to practice with the analysis of perspective and purpose using those documents, but also give them the opportunity to show their mastery or their knowledge from what would this look like in a visual? What would this look like in um, a speech, what would, and be able to show what they know, however, is most comfortable for them, but they're still mastering the content. I love that. I think that's such a, like, transferable piece of content knowledge. Like, it, it doesn't live alone um, in just this indicator. I love, I love seeing how you're transferring that to their uh, writing as well. It's awesome. Um, space Cat. Oh, tell, tell me more about this Space Cat. Oh, so Space Cat is an acronym that I use when I teach rhetoric, and it goes really well with the rhetorical triangle. And it talks about your speaker, their perspective, the audience, um, the context, um, and the appeals, like all of it. It's all encompassed in this cute little acronym. And it really, I taught English too last year, and it really changed the game like they really understood it I love that I, and and that's something I've never heard of before so like one of my favorite parts about these webinars is that you are all experts in the content that you teach and then you're coming here and sharing these with all of us um it's just widening our toolbox um so I love that yes Je <laughs> Jessica said will you tie that out Amber <laughs> I think we're all trying to steal an idea I love that <laughs> That is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, anybody else? Thank y'all. Monica, I love your feedback on the rhetorical devices document or from fiction. Um, I love that um, piece of feedback. We um, do revise and uh, republish our support documents on a yearly cycle. So having that feedback can give us a place to um, maybe look for ways to refine um, that support document or or to um, add some additional resources to support. So I appreciate that feedback. Thank you. Andy, I'll put in the chat our um, feedback form, actually, that you can put any suggestions that you have on our support, any of our support documents. Um, and then we go back and look at those. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. OK, now let's take a look at crosswalking that seventh grade indicator. So again, on the left side, you're going to see the um, new indicator for AOR 4.1. And then on the right side, we see our 2015 indicator that aligns to it. So the green boxes are going to pop up. Those are the things that are the same. I see a lot of similarities, right? Determining an author's purpose. 
um, or I'm sorry, determining an author's perspective or purpose. Those are similar. Um, we also see our yellow box pop up. What does that yellow box RI 5.1 tell us? <laughs> overarching expectation three and overarching expectation five. But if we look back at the left hand side and we see the new aspect of our um, indicator that is new content or um, a new expectation in our um, 2024 ELA standards, we see that rhetoric is included here. Rhetoric is not listed in the correlating indicator in 2015. But we also see we're determining how an author uses that rhetoric to advance the perspective or purpose. That will need to be an intentional instructional um, choice for us. It'll be a part of our planning, our classroom assessment, so that we can really meet the intent of that 2024 indicator. So just a place for us to focus our attention on, um, and hopefully we provided you some resources to support that instruction. Now we're going to take a look at the eighth grade indicator. What do we notice about the rigor here? We go from determine to analyze. All right, so we're back doing analysis. Um, what I'd like for you to do in the chat now is respond with this sentence frame. I think the rigor changed from determine in seventh grade to analyze in eighth grade because. So go ahead and drop that in the chat. Tell me why you think the rigor changed from determine to analyze. What's intentional about that? Um, rigor increase. Not just determining those connections, but now explaining them. Very good. That explanation is very important. Once you're able to determine, then you can analyze. Yes, it is a progression, right? We're not going to throw you off the deep end and expect you to analyze before you're able to determine. Determining is making uh, conclusions and analyzing involves determining as well as their evaluation. Higher level thinking. Excellent. Yes, y'all are right. Um, <laughs> good insights. So now let's look at the content shifts. So the content shifts here um, is that last little piece. We have perspective, we have purpose, we have rhetoric, same as seventh grade. But look at that last line, advance the perspective or purpose. Advance the perspective or purpose. All right, again, our indicator insight says to um, refer to the rhetoric support document. We just looked at those. Um, but let's take a closer look at that advancing the perspective or purpose. What does that mean? What is advancing the perspective or purpose? It's all about that impact. Very good, yes. is being very intentional with the language chosen and analyzing how did the author use that language to advance their perspective or purpose. We're, yeah, Sheree, we're looking at their intention. How are they getting the message across? How can an author effectively advance their perspective or purpose? by persuading the audience to accept their viewpoint or take a desired action. Awesome. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to our next slide. And um, I want us to stop for just a second. Now, seventh and eighth grade indicators were very similar. Um, we saw a little bit of shift in the rigor from determined to analyze. 
We saw a little bit of shift um, by using that intentional language of um, advancing the perspective or purpose, but we'll often come across um, indicators that are very similar or the same between grade levels. A seventh and eighth grade for AOR 4.1 is a good example of that. Um, when you are working with teachers or you're working with the standards yourself and you come across this where, hmm, this indicator looks very similar to the one just before it or the one after it. One way that you can intentionally shift your instruction or your practice or your planning around that indicator is by taking a look at the grade level entering statements for um, those grade levels. So here we have a screenshot of the seventh grade grade level entering statement. We want to focus closely in on paragraph three. Paragraph three, um, if you'll click again, Brenna, it'll pop up a smaller text or a larger text box. I've zoomed in on paragraph three. And I want to particularly focus on the suggestions of informational text that be, can be included in your instruction. So um, click again, Brenna, and you'll see that they could be historical documents, news articles, speeches, personal essays, memoirs, autobiographical, biographical sketches, and so forth. The grade level entering statement for seventh grade offers a variety of text types that can be used in support of the instruction around that indicator. Similarly, let's take a look at the eighth grade entering statement. Again, this is eighth grade entering statement. We're looking at paragraph three. We're zooming in here just on the informational texts that are suggested for instruction to support the instruction of the indicators. Here we see some similar um, suggestions, but there are also some that are very specific just to eighth grade. One way to differentiate when indicators are similar grade to grade is by looking at those um, grade level entering statements and the text types that are suggested and focusing our instruction um, with those different suggestions. So just one uh, place where you can kind of focus in your instruction. Additionally, when indicators are similar grade to grade, um, another place that we can kind of focus our attention is by considering text complexity. You can use, um, so here are two different articles um, all about ocean uh, swimming and ocean safety. Now, they have very different perspectives. <laughs> One article is by State Farm and the title is Testing the Waters Tips for Ocean Swimming Safety. The other article is by Island Water Sports Hawaii, which is a, uh, uh, a organization that tries to get you to travel to Hawaii and engage in their ocean water sports. And it says the seven remarkable health benefits of being in the ocean. Already, my uh, alarms are going off that the perspectives here are going to be very different. There's going to be rhetoric used to sway your opinion in both of these. But I want us to take a look at those numbers in the boxes at the top. They fall within the same Lexile range. Now, the Island Water Sports article is a little um, more difficult Lexile level, but they're in relatively the same range. They're also within the range suitable for 7th and 8th grade. I want you to think for just a second, and Brenna dropped the um, link to both of these articles in the chat. How could you see yourself using these articles in your seventh grade classroom or your eighth grade classroom to meet the intent of the indicator? I'm going to give you about two minutes to look over that and think about that. And then um, I'd love for you to respond in the chat how you could see yourself using these. Beth, that's a great um, that's a great question. So uh, we have we use a tool called the uh, Lexile Text Analyzer. Um, Brenna, if you'll grab the link for that and drop it in the chat, Lexile.com offers a free membership where you can use their Lexile Text Analyzer tool. It gives you free analysis, free 
50 free analysis a month. Uh, all you do is you copy and paste your text into their Lexile Text Analyzer. Uh, you run the analysis and then it provides you the Lexile level. Um, it's, a, it's an awesome tool and it's free. <laughs> Perfect, Brenna, thank you. <laughs> we use it so often, Beth. It also pulls out the most uh, difficult vocabulary words for you, the longest sentence. It gives you suggested texts that are similar in Lexile level. It's a pretty incredible tool. Okay. Very different intentions. I love that. Anybody wanna unmute and share? Jessica, I love your um, comment around the two articles that for seventh grade, you could just focus on determining the rhetoric that's used in the State Farm article versus the Island Water Sports article. But then in eighth grade, you could analyze how that impacts the audience. Um, yeah, definitely makes you want to go swimming in the ocean, right? <laughs> Compare and contrast the intentions of the article. Excellent. Excellent. Oh. Y'all, I can't wait for our next session together. All right. For the sake of time, we're going to keep moving on. Um, let's take a look at our eighth grade crosswalk comparison. So looking at our eighth grade indicator, you're going to see a lot of shifts. The only similarity we see is the use of the word analyze in both of them. Um, so there we go. See, analyze how an author uses rhetoric. Analyze how the author acknowledges or responds to conflicting viewpoints. We see difference in um, they're analyzing the author's perspective or purpose in our new standard. They were determining the author's purpose or perspective in 2015. We do see the connection again to overarching expectation three and overarching expectation with the connection of RI 5.1. But we see a lot of differences. For your eighth grade teachers, what are the implications of recognizing these differences? What do we notice about the difference in our eighth grade indicator from 2015 to our new standards? Well, if you um, are a teacher of eighth grade or you know some teachers of eighth grade, you are going to have a lot of shifting on your hands. Um, you're going to need to really adjust your planning, instruction, and classroom assessments because so much of the indicator changed. Um, now, one part of the 2015 standard says acknowledges or responds to conflicting evidence or viewpoints. Um, this part of the 2015 indicator has actually shifted to a different standard. Um, and Casey Prince Harvey, do you want to speak to that really quickly? Sure. So um, where we see this shift um, into what we call alternative perspective and then counterclaim is going to be in C. 1.1 that's writing arguments where students are actually applying this knowledge so they begin that in sixth grade with acknowledging an alternative perspective then they move in seventh grade to um, acknowledging a counterclaim and then in eighth grade they refute the counterclaim so all of that is built into the writing that students do and that's where you're going to see that shift in language very good. Thank you, Casey. Um, OK, so eighth grade teachers got a heavy load on your backs um, making those shifts. Let's take a look um, at our eighth grade indicator one more time. Um, here we see our 
indicator was, or our rigor was analyzed. Our content, the biggest shift in that was to advance the perspective or purpose. Our indicator insight dealt with looking at the rhetoric support document. But for eighth grade, we need to know that we know the rigor and content of this indicator because it is such a shift from our 2015 standards. All right, now let's move to English 1. Um, in our English 1 indicator, we see that our rigor shifts to analyze. Our content continues to include perspective and purpose and rhetoric, but one big shift is to this content of the effectiveness of the text. So, what is effectiveness of the text? That relates back to advancing the text. Effectiveness is to, um, if a text is effective, it meets its purpose, convinces the audience to agree with the author or the speaker. Does the author do a good job of making their point? Very good. Now let's take a look at the crosswalk. Um, so for English 1, we see um, the similarities. Uh, or we do see the RI 5.1 connection to overarching expectation three and five again. We do see that we are analyzing how the author uses rhetoric in 2015 and in our new indicator. But we see a lot of content on the left in our new indicator that are differences. Again, our English one teachers need to be intentional with how they are going to instruct uh, this new indicator because it's such a shift. Um, in 2015, we were still determining. And then in our new standards, we are analyzing. So quite a big shift. Now, one place that we need to focus our attention, though, as well, is comparing our eighth grade indicator to our English one indicator. because. What considerations need to be made for our eighth grade students that are taking English 1? How will this impact their the teacher's planning and instruction? So if you're an eighth grade teacher and you teach English 1, what do you need to consider? What content should you include in regard to the instruction of AOR 4.1 to meet both the indicator for eighth grade and the indicator for English 1? While there will not be a compaction document produced by our office, that needs to be something carefully considered by you as the teacher. Yeah, there's definitely significant vocabulary um, that we need to take a look at. Analysis of making the point, and then not going to be the analysis of how well the point is made. Ooh, Jessica, that sounds uh, like it could be an indicator insight. <laughs> They've skipped eighth grade English, so we have to fill in the gap, Jen Hamilton. Yes. Oh, that is that is that could be the uh, phrase we coin uh, for all of our discussions around that eighth grade English one discussion. I love that. All right. Whew, that brings us to our closure for section two, and it's called New Now and Next. So what I'd like for you to do is answer one of these questions for me. What new information did you learn today? Was there anything new that was discussed? Um, maybe it was new for you that eighth grade is so different from it was in 2015. Um, maybe it was new that you weren't aware of the rhetoric support document and supplements. Um, now, what is this information have you thinking about now? What is your next step? Um, what do you want to do to apply the learning that um, we encountered today? If you will, drop your answer to one of these in the chat. New, now, or next. Oh, the support documents. And I tell you, um, if you ever need a uh, space cat, <laughs> I love that. If you ever need a thinking partner in regard to rhetoric, Casey Prince Harvey is our resident expert in all things rhetoric. In fact, she has built my capacity in understanding rhetoric um, more than 
it, more than I can explain, more than I can tell you. So if you ever want to think in partner or have rhetoric questions, she's an excellent thinking partner to bounce ideas off of. <laughs> the Lexile Leveling website. <laughs> That's a great tool too. I tell you what, um, I use it very often. Uh, oh, I love that, Cherie. The support documents were great. I love that. Thank you so much for that feedback. Um, that warms my heart that we are bringing y'all to these support documents. Um, you know, we we send out that they're published and we post them on our website, but um, getting that information into the actual hands of practitioners is so difficult. Um, communication is just such a roadblock for us. So I appreciate that y'all are seeing those for the first time or maybe rediscovering them. I, I feel really excited about that. Please share, share them out um, with all those that you uh, teach with and support. All right, now let's go back to our agenda. We're going to do some clarity and closure now. We will revisit our purpose. Our purpose today was to explore AOR 4.1 for grades 5 through 9 and really understand the difference between purpose and perspective. Um, so in the chat, you can describe one way that purpose was met. Did we differentiate between purpose and perspective? And did we give any instructional strategies or improve student outcomes with that discussion? I see so many great comments rolling in. I was dabbing my eye just now because it's dry, but y'all also might make me cry with some of these <laughs> awesome pieces of feedback y'all are dropping. I appreciate that. You can't cry, Mandy. I'm the crier. <laughs> I know. That's Brenna's job, right? <laughs> oh, okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, we want to kind of close our session today um, because that was a ton of information. And you may be feeling a little paralyzed by all the things that we discussed, especially if you're an eighth grade or an English one teacher thinking, whoa, so much of my instruction has to shift. Or um, even our fifth through um, seventh grade teachers of, ah, I teach this already, but now I got to teach this other part of the indicator too. You may be feeling that way. Um, but what I want you to think about is I want you to visualize just one student for whom the information that was shared today or the new practices that we thought of, uh, talked through, the understanding, the learning, whatever we discussed today. Think of one student for whom that information that we talked through today would really matter. So for me, it would be Teresa. And this information matters to Teresa because if I do my job of explaining author's purpose and author's perspective and how they use rhetoric to convey that, then Teresa's going to be better prepared for her entry into the real world, right? She's going to know when she comes across those political cartoons or political advertisements, what that author's purpose is, what that author's perspective is, and how they're using rhetoric to advance that. Think about that um, for yourselves. Think about who it would matter to in your life. Hopefully, you've got that student in mind, um, your Teresa, that this information would really impact and really matter to. And then it brings us to our feedback survey. Uh, in the chat, we're going to drop the link to our feedback form. Uh, I was the presenter today. My name is Mandy Hawker again. Uh, the title of our session was AOR 4.1 Part 1. Um, and I'd love just to have your feedback. Uh, I use this feedback to inform my next steps as a presenter, but also it informs our next steps as an ELA team. Um, the things that you drop in that feedback form help us to kind of vision cast what our next steps are um, for ELA in South Carolina. So anything that you suggest in there, we take very seriously um, of how we can better support you all um, as uh, the, the speakers and the people in these classrooms um, supporting our students and getting them to student success. So um, if you'll fill out that feedback form, that's also how we will record your um, participation today. Make sure you do that before you exit our meeting. Brenna also dropped the link for our summer webinar registration. If you are interested in attending um, part two of this session, it's gonna be on July 5th um, from 10 to 1130 in the morning. Make sure you register on that summer registration link. 
And then on July 26, we have Casey Prince Harvey's presentation on AOR 5.3 coming up. Um, and that one whoo, is quite an impactful indicator. Um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very hefty shift. So we hope you'll be able to join us for that. All right. You are welcome to drop any lingering questions in the chat or include them on the feedback form. We will listen and linger for the next about 10 minutes if you have any questions, but thank you for joining us today. Um, we appreciate you being here with us. Thank you, guys.